going to share part of how I got here, not like from London to Cheltenham, but how I got to the point where I can talk about this and not feel like a phony. Right? Because if I had given this talk, there are many stages of my life where if I had gotten, to give, gotten up and given a talk, and I didn't, but if I had gotten up to give a talk called An End of Stress, I could have been very persuasive and very dynamic and very exciting and, and full of crap. <laughs> okay? Because it wasn't my experience. Now, when I say this is my experience, I don't mean I never experience any stress. Anyone who knows me will be happy to like, tell stories about me afterwards, my, starting with my wife, through my business manager, through my friends, everyone. However, as I've seen more and more about how this actually works, I experience less and less stress without having to pull back. I live a full-on life, but, but it's fine. And people go, my God, how do you handle this? How do you handle that? And it's surprisingly how often I don't know what they're talking about. Because I didn't see it as a big deal at the time. And it's nothing I did, it's not the result of practice, it's not, because I'm special. We're all special. I mean, we are probably, but that's not the point. Right? It's the result of getting a glimpse, getting an, uh, that much of a deeper understanding of how things really work. And that's the direction we're going to look in together. So, for me, the journey started. I didn't know I was on a journey, right? I didn't like go, right, it's time to start the journey. Let's get depressed and suicidal. But that's how it started for me, right? I was, I was uh, a, a, just a depressed teen and started having, uh, you know, I, I actually remember the first time it ever came up was in the, uh, I think it was the sixth grade. And we, we, there was a presentation on the American Civil War. And the big issue was slavery. And uh, so we had a school conversation about the, um, the, you know, slavery. And I grew up in the, uh, the, the northeast of America, near Boston, New England. Um, we made a total copy. It's really weird. It's, it, uh, I did. I grew up in Shrewsbury next to Worcester. Just not here. <laughs> and... Uh, And they did a discussion and they said, what would you have done if you were President of the United States at the time of the American Civil War? And you basically had a choice between doing what you thought was right and freeing the slaves but risking this nation that had been around for not even a hundred years on your watch falling apart, going to war, or keeping the country together, preventing war, but compromising on your moral stance. Right? Good topic of debate for school kids. And honestly, had that topic of debate happened in the southern part of America, don't know how it would have gone. Where I was, everybody was like, one by one, you know, free the slaves, free the slaves, free the slaves. They got to me and I said, I'd kill myself. Now, it was a completely innocent comment. Because I thought about it and I thought, God, I'd hate to be in that position. That'd be awful to have all, I just, to me, the more I thought about it, the more stressful that felt. And so it just occurred to me, I just thought, well, that's it, I, I, I just killed myself. I didn't think that was a big deal, but everyone else did, right? And so I, I got taken to the special doctor, <laughs> right? And suddenly I thought it was a big deal too. It was like, oh my God, what have I said? <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to think that? Oh, okay, God, there's something wrong with me. And of course, I thought I'd better try not to think about that. Well, we all know how good a strategy that is, right? So I tried really hard not to think about that for years, and of course, every year, I thought about it more and more. I got very depressed, like clinical depression, like miserable depressed, like uh, one of the highlights, maybe low lights, I don't know. But I, re I remember like one of the points at which I realized that maybe I was in a little bit of trouble emotionally was I, I, I got a gift of a Mickey Mouse sweatshirt from my sister, who'd been living out in California, we were on the East Coast, and I burst into tears because Mickey's pants were the wrong color. I was 19. <laughs> and even, like, even in my fogged brain, I went, this isn't good. <laughs> so then an experience happened and I share this in, in my books, and I, but, but it, it really happened. I mean, it, it, I was in a dorm room, and all of a sudden, 
It felt like a giant vacuum cleaner in the sky. I couldn't see it. I wasn't hallucinating in that sense. But it really felt like I was being sucked out the window by this something, by this force. And I was literally clinging to the wall of my room to not get sucked out the window. And there was a phone there. And I thought, this might be a good time to use that number I've been saving for the suicide hotline. But that might be a good idea. I dialed it, and I got a busy signal. And to this day, I think that saved my life, because I thought that was funny. It's like, I don't care how bad it is. That's funny. I mean, I was thinking, like, what's it going to do, rain next? You know? And it kind of calmed me down. It popped me out of my head a little bit. I found my bearings. I called a friend. And they got me out of there, and it was fine. Well, a couple days later, I was thinking about that. I was thinking, that's really interesting, because I've been thinking about killing myself all these years, and all I would have had to do last night is let go. Like, that's it. There would have been no effort, no active will, no design, no great plan, no note. <laughs> I would have just let go. I said, I was, holy cow, I don't want to kill myself. That was huge. <laughs> Because I'd been thinking about it for all these years and thinking I shouldn't think about it. And suddenly I went, oh my God, it's just a thought. And I, I named it, not very creatively, admittedly. I called it the suicide thought. And I continued to have it for a while. But when it came, it was just like, oh, it's the suicide thought again. It, was, it wasn't a scary monster anymore. Because I saw it was just my own thinking. And it wasn't even based on it, you know, there was no truth to it. It was this almost like a bad habit that I had never noticed was me. I thought it was happening to me. And of course, because I wasn't scared of it anymore, because I wasn't trying to fight it, because I wasn't trying to control my thinking with my mighty willpower, it stopped coming so often. And eventually I noticed that it only came when I was feeling really stressed. I would feel stressed and I would have that thought, because that thought was an escape thought for me. It was like, ooh, that would get me out of this feeling that I don't like. And we've all got them. We've all got our escape thoughts. That wh whatever it is, man, if I could just go, if I could just go off, get unconscious, however I choose to get unconscious, that would be great. Then I wouldn't have to feel this way anymore. And of course, it just got less and less. Well, now, I, I got married quite young. I got married, uh, well, Nina and I got together when I was 20. We got married, I think, when I was 23. But it wasn't until we'd been married a couple of years that I told her about this, because this all happened in America. She's English. So, like, I got away with it. Like, <laughs> Pay no attention to where I came from, darling. I'm English like you. Um, but it just, you know, one night it came up, and I, I, and I told her the story. And, uh, and she got quiet, you know, I think it was a bit to take in. She knew I was like moody, <laughs> but I think that was a bit heavy. And, uh, and she said, you know, I actually know exactly what you're talking about. And I said, really? You don't seem to me remotely depressed. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I have a thought like that, though. I call it the divorce thought. And uh, apparently, I'm not always easy to live with. I mean, go figure. I don't know. <laughs> but, but she said early on in her marriage, and, uh, you know, whenever it, she got stressed, she would think, well, this isn't going to work. I mean, marriages don't work. So many marriages don't work. My parents' marriage didn't work. You know, I, we just need to get divorced. Let's get it. Let's just get it. It was an escape thought, right? And at some point, she realized that despite the fact that I am not the most tidy man on the planet, and that from time to time, I do things that may seem irrational, to those of you who are rational. She liked me, <laughs> and she wanted to live with me. And so it became just a thought. It lost its power, because she could see what it was. It was just a thought. Thoughts, right, we are so scared of thoughts in the, in the, in the, in the sort of spiritual community, in the sort of self-development community, because thoughts are things, and thoughts have power, and you've got to think these thoughts, and not think those thoughts, and bad thoughts, good thoughts. And, they could th and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey through that, right? Because I went through all that, absolutely. A thought has no power until it comes to life through our consciousness. And then it's got all sorts of power, right? Then it can affect everything. Then we can measure its effect in the bloodstream. We can see the release of cortisol and <laughs> adrenaline and noradrenaline and all that kind of stuff in our brain and in our bodies. And we get really stressed out. And we can kind of connect it up. But 
A thought is no more powerful than a tea bag without hot water. Right? I don't care if you don't like a particular tea. It, 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 it's not that scary in bag form. <laughs> Lapsang Sushong. Lapsang Sushong! <laughs> right? It's just, it's just, it, but once you pour hot water on it, it brings it to life. Well, consciousness brings our thinking to life. We experience our thinking as if it was really happening. And we physiologically could be sitting on a park bench, and if we were hooked up to an EEG machine and an EKG machine, just because we're thinking and consciousness is bringing our thoughts to life, it would look, if you were just reading the EEG and the EKG, like we were really busy. And there was all sorts of stuff going on, right? Because that's the experience that we have. So for me, sorry, I'm going to. I went through the sort of usual pathways that most people go through to try and be happier, you know, to try and have a better life. Because that's kind of what you do. You start out and you go, how do I have a good life? And you kind of look outside you and you go, well, according to, to Hello Magazine, the way to have, uh, I mean, there is no better source, right? <laughs> I mean, look, come on, millions of readers can't be wrong. Uh, so, you know, apparently the secret of success is to have lots of great stuff and be famous and pretty. I thought, well, I can do that. Right? So that was my plan. <laughs> well, it doesn't actually work that way. I'd, uh, it turns out, and if you actually read Hello Magazine for more than a month, you'll see the same people who were on the front cover because they were the happiest, most successful people on earth back in there because they're now the most miserable, broken people on earth. And then they go back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, it, it's interesting. So it dawned on me pretty quickly this was not the secret of happiness. That, that no matter how successful I got, that was unlikely to be the actual path to a, to a better life. And, and maybe you found that for yourself to a certain point. Maybe you're still in that, that place. There's a prayer in the 12-step programs. Dear Lord, I know that success and wealth will not bring me true and lasting happiness. But Lord, please let me find that out for myself. <laughs> so maybe you're still there, and that's cool. But I got that that wasn't going to do it. So I thought maybe being a good person might be a good idea. Right? I'd read that in another book. Right? That being a good person would be maybe the path to a happy and fulfilling life. So I set out to do the right thing wherever I could. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. But not as a strategy for being happy. Because what I found is sometimes I did the right thing, and I found that even more stressful, in fact, often <laughs> more stressful than doing the easy thing. <laughs> and so at some point I went, this strategy isn't working either. So I ticked it off the list. It's like, OK, it's not having the right stuff. It's not doing the right stuff, so then I got into self-help. It's thinking the right stuff. That's the secret. I just need to think only positive thoughts. <laughs> Easy! For almost like 10 minutes, I did it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I realized I was going to be alive a little longer than that. So, so I got more creative, and I started studying more advanced psychologies and things like NLP and you know where I could learn to to program my mind so I didn't have to manually switch the thoughts to positive I could program myself so my brain would work in a positive direction and it got better okay not gonna lie it got better but man it took a hell of a lot of work to maintain it's like spinning plates Right? Okay, yeah, yeah, we're going good. This is good. Yeah, now I'm thinking positive thoughts about this. Ooh, no bad thoughts about the relationship. Let me go fix that. Oh my God, what's happening with my business? Oh, ah! Right? And it, it's, if you've tried that as your primary strategy for happiness, you've probably found you couldn't pull it off. It, it, please raise your hand if, if you've had an experience like that. Right? Where you tried, I'm going to think the right things, I'm going to do the right things, I'm going to get the right stuff, and it didn't work. Okay? It's, it, most people do. I mean, that's just a natural. Even if you weren't in this room, if I did this with a group of people who thought they were coming to see Eddie Izzard or something, they, 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 if they answered honestly, they would say the same thing. Because those are the strategies we're given. Those are the choices we're given. Now, what's interesting is what people make up about why it didn't work. Because what almost everybody makes up about why positive thinking doesn't work sustainably is 
I must be doing it wrong. I must not be trying hard enough. Maybe I read the wrong book. Maybe if I read this book, this one will work. Oh, I got, I've gone to, you know, I went to the wrong teacher. Now I found the real teacher, and for six months it's great, and then you find out that, huh, this still isn't working. Oh, maybe, I got, maybe, I, maybe I've got the wrong practice, or I, I need to go deeper in my practice. And we do it, and for a while it helps. And then we find we're still there. And that was my experience. If my life was better, do not get me wrong, my life was better and better and better. It was a million miles away from where it had been. But I knew in my heart of hearts, I was about two weeks away from being right back in the thick of the depression, right back in the thick of the stress, right back in the thick of all of that. Now, I was doing everything I could to not go two weeks without it, but that was it. That was my buffer. At my best, that was my buffer. I had two weeks. Two weeks of not practicing, two weeks of not reading the positive stuff, two weeks of not ingesting positivity before I would be down, down in the... And, I, and, and at some level, I thought, this can't be right. But on the other hand, I didn't have any other idea. Like, no, nobody seemed to have a better suggestion. People kind of said, yeah, that's how it is. That's the nature of life. You've got to work hard at this. Right? No pain, no gain. You get out what you put in. And, and so that was, that was kind of what I knew. And then, by accident, really, I, I came across a different understanding, a different way of explaining how our experience is created. And I, I, at first, I didn't even really get it. I just noticed that everything in my life seemed better. And it was weird. I mean, it was to the point where I'd had this big problem. And a friend who read a book on this understanding and, and he said, oh, you've got to read this book. It'll really help with your problem. And I mean, this was, this was a pretty big problem I was facing. It felt it at the time. And, and I thought, oh, God, I've got nothing better to do. I read the book. And about a week later, a friend called and said, hey, how's it going with that problem? And I said, what problem? And he said, what do you mean, what problem? You know, you were, you were saying that you were going to have to change all this stuff. Let, it took me a couple of minutes to even remember what he was talking about. And I thought, that's weird. Perhaps I should learn everything I can about this. Because I had no idea what happened, I just knew something fundamental had shifted. So I started to study, and even before I really knew what I was talking about, I started talking to people about it. And I, in fact, I decided to do a little experiment, because I'd been coaching people for years. So there's no shortage of people who would send me a, um, I used to call them the, um, the, the Star Wars letters, you know, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're our only hope. <laughs> and, and, you know, in fairness, I, I, I did what I could and I shared them out with other people, but I generally would not take them on because I was a coach, not a therapist, and I, I was pretty clean about that. So I wrote to three people. I picked three extreme cases. And I wrote to them and I said, look, I'm, I'm experimenting with this new thing understand, I don't even know what to call it, it's not a technique, it's not a practice, it's just a new way of understanding things that makes so much sense to me, and I'd like to have a chat with you about it. And I said, now I just need you to sign this form that says you recognize that you're an idiot to talk to me about this because I don't know what I'm doing. I live in California, you've got to cover yourself, right? <laughs> and so I, I decided I was going to just have three conversations and put this to the test. And the first conversation, I did them by phone, First conversation was with a, a, a woman who'd been on um, psychological disability for seven years, had had a good job, had had a trauma, couldn't concentrate anymore, got a leave of absence, couldn't get herself back together to go back, gone through a lot, and they were about to cut off her psychological disability. And of course, there's nothing that reduces stress like knowing they're going to take away your psychological. So she was like twice as bad as she'd ever been, and yet was about to lose her means of support. That's why she reached out to me. And we just chatted about what we're going to be chatting about, what we already are chatting about, about this new understanding. And it was a pleasant conversation. That's the best way I can describe it. I mean, it didn't seem that profound, really. It was, but it was really nice. There was a nice feeling, right? You know, it, 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 another way I sometimes talk to a group is I say, listen for a feeling. If there's a nice feeling in the conversation, you're getting it. Okay? If you're in a nice feeling, it's going in. If you're not, it's OK. It's the fan's just spinning. But if you've got kind of a nice feeling, it's going in. So there was a nice feeling on the conversation. She called me back three days later, and I said, uh, 
hey, nice to speak to you. How's it going? She said, well, I've got 12 job interviews. <laughs> I mean, she had been totally like, I, I can't do this. I can't even think about it. A couple of weeks later, she phoned back. She found a job. She was fine. And I'm sitting there, honestly, thinking, I don't believe this. Right? Uh, that my best techniques had never gotten that kind of result. But I'm intrigued, right? I'm thinking, OK, maybe I should keep exploring this. So the second conversation with uh, a woman who had obsessive compulsive disorder and had spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on uh, both treatment but also on remodeling. Because <laughs> that, was, that was like how it came out is, oh, uh, this room has to change. Oh, this room has to change. Oh, this room has to change. And again, just had a chat, a nice chat, like the chat that we're having here. It was a pleasant chat. I didn't know if anything had really gone in, but she called me back. Actually, she, she emailed me. I still have the email. And she said, that hour and a half that we spent chatting has done more for me than seven years on the NHS and all the money that I've spent on therapy. And I'm sitting there, honest to God, not feeling cool about myself, but feeling really confused. Because I used to work really hard to help people. Had a third chat. And this time it was with a guy who had said that he was suicidal. And I feel a kinship with people who feel that. I've been there. It's not nice, right? You know, there's a, there's a commercial in America, depression hurts. It does, right? If you've dealt with it, it hurts. So I had a real, my heart went out to this guy. But in my head, I sort of thought he was just saying that to get my attention. <laughs> well, I call and his wife answers the phone. And she says, oh, are you the coach guy? And I went, yes, that's me. And uh, she said, good, because he keeps asking me to kill him, and I am sick of this. <laughs> and in my head, I am going, oh, dear God, what have I done? <laughs> but we had a chat, and there was a nice feeling. And at the end of the chat, honestly, I could tell he didn't really get it. But one of the things that he was worried about, that it, his wife would leave him. And based on the little chat I had with her, I thought he might have a point. So I said, do you mind if I chat with your wife? And he said, no. And she came on. And within five minutes, she said to me, you know, I was going to leave him. I'd had it. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't want to leave him. I love him. And I just actually, so that, again, to me was remarkable. Just to bring that, that story to a close, I actually stayed in touch with the guy. And he went through a lot. But I got an email from him. Um, do you remember when it was? I think it was during Supercoach Academy, because it was, I, I, it, it was within the last six months saying, completely great, turned it around, life is great. That was a few years on. So for me, what that told me was that this was probably worth looking deeper into. And what I find, the deeper I've looked into this, is that the only reason I can come up for with why it works is because it's true. Now, I am not a guy who would have stood up here even five years ago and tried to talk to anyone about what's true. Right? I would have been the one in the audience going, who's truth specifically? Truth according to whom? By what standard? How are you measuring that? How are you evaluating that? Right? So I, I am not predisposed to think in terms of truth. But there are certain things I've come to see that just are true. For example, people think. Yes, that's just kind of true. I mean, I'm sure there is a way of arguing it, but the point is people think. That's just true. People are conscious. They are aware. Maybe not that aware. Maybe aware of some things and not others. But people have the capacity for consciousness. That's a truth. Right? That's not a personal point of view. The personal point of view would be what are the implications of that, what that means, where it comes from, how it works. People think. People have consciousness. People are alive when they're alive. Right? Those are just simple truths. And what I find really interesting is for having spent so long arguing for my right, for my personal truth, to see that actually there was a there there, that there there actually is something behind life that's just true. I'll give you an example of a, you, you know, a, a, a simple truth. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see. Let's get one here. You got a pen. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a little party trick, a good bar trick as well you can do. I said I wasn't going to teach any techniques, but just this one. Okay, you go up to somebody at a bar, you want to really impress them, and you show them this. Check it out. Pretty cool, huh? You want to see it again? I can do it right-handed, too. Not even looking. You don't think that's a miracle? Well, you probably don't, because we grew up with it. We grew up knowing that somehow when we let go of stuff, it falls. If you think about it, that's amazing. But we've grown up with it, so we don't see its, its amazingness. And we don't even notice its implications in things like exercise and physiology and flight and design and the way it informs so much of what we do on the planet. Because we've just grown up with it. It's just how it works. It's just what is. Thought and consciousness are the same. We've grown up with them, so we don't really think about them. We don't really have a point of view about them. It's just, yeah, I think. Everyone thinks. So what? Well, it turns out that it's a pretty big so what. Because the only way that we can have an experience on this planet, best I can tell, is through thought. We experience our thinking. The only way we can have an emotion is through thought. We, there's no thought, there's no emotion. Which means that every experience you have ever experienced and will ever, exp ever experience, including this one, is a product of thought and consciousness. That's profound. And if it doesn't sound profound to you, know that I'm with you. Because when I first heard it, I was like, and? 